With that, let's get into the Word. 2 Kings chapter 5 tonight. Again, looking forward to what the Lord has for us. A uh, very interesting chapter. I know I say that about every chapter, but a uh, very interesting chapter uh, that's before us tonight. So uh, why don't we go ahead and pray. We'll ask God's blessing on our time together in His Word, if you would join with me. Oh, Lord, thank you. Thank you so much <clears throat> for all that you're doing, Lord. We give you all the glory and all the praise. Lord, we're so thankful to you for just your, your goodness and your faithfulness to us and just the way that you always show yourself so faithful. Lord, we want to tonight just set aside everything now and um, all the busyness of the week, just the, the distractions of the cares and the affairs of our busy lives, Lord. We just want to set all of that aside and focus our attention upon you and your word and that which you have for us in your word tonight. So, Lord, would you minister to us now as we commit our time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's jump in. Verse 1. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> now, Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him <coughs> the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but, and this is a big one, he was a leper. So the chapter begins by introducing us to an interesting man, as we're going to see, by the name of Naaman. And we're told that he was an honorable man uh, and a mighty man of valor. There's not very many men in the Bible that uh, it says of them that they were a mighty man of valor. And apparently he was the military commander of the army of Syria. However, we're also told that uh, this man had leprosy, which at the time, and even now for the most part, uh, is an incurable disease. Uh, it's not curable today, but modern medicine has really advanced in treating this hideous disease, and it is hideous. Uh, we don't call it leprosy actually today anymore. We call it Hansen's disease. And again, it's still incurable, but it is uh, to some degree uh, somewhat manageable. Verse 2, and the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then, verse 3, she said to her mistress, <coughs> pardon me, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, of course she's speaking of Elisha, for he would heal him of his leprosy. Of course, not Elisha, but uh, Elisha's God would heal him. So now we're introduced to Naaman's servant, who it seems uh, is wanting to reciprocate kindness to her master, who himself must have been a kind man as well as an honorable man, uh, which we're told. But the reason I say that and, and sort of conclude that is because were he an unkind master, it wouldn't be very likely that she would even bring this to his wife's attention in the first place. In other words, she wants for him to not only be healed, and she knows Elisha, uh, and the God of Elisha, who is his, her God as well, uh, can heal her master, her employer, if you prefer. Now, the reason I mention this is because, to me, it speaks to how it is that oftentimes the Lord will place us in positions like this in order for us to reach the lost for Christ. You know, sometimes... We wonder about our occupations and what we do and where the Lord has us and our, you know, careers and uh, where we work. And uh, 
I really believe that God oftentimes will put us in those positions if for no other reason other than to be a light to those whom we are employed by and even the co-workers that we work with and that's why God has us there and oftentimes that's the purpose and the primary purpose and the purpose is our jobs or careers are for the glory of God and to reach the lost. I also get the impression, this is kind of an interesting, we're not told her name, this nameless young girl uh, who was taken captive by force from her family in Israel, presumably. And she was obviously a godly young lady and she obviously was trained up in the things of the Lord and had a tremendous witness uh, for the Lord. And as we're going to see, and for those of you who read ahead to stay ahead, you already know how this ends. He is going to get saved, and he is going to get uh, healed. Verse 4, Now, Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel, then the king of Syria said, verse 5, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, do the math on this, <laughs> and ten changes of clothing. Now that may sound kind of nebulous, but you have to understand in that day, clothing was very valuable. Uh, and really only the well-to-do had changes of clothing as was the case here. Now verse 6, then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, now be advised, when this letter comes to you, that I have sent to sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. So this is Jehoram now, who is the recipient of this letter. And it happened, verse 7, when the king of Israel read the letter, that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him of leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. In other words, something's not right here. What's up with this guy? Uh, something's not on the up and up. Well, this is interesting for a couple of reasons, not the least of which is that it's estimated by some that he sent the equivalent of what would be in modern day uh, uh, the equivalent of 1.2 million dollars along with this letter, which makes me kind of think that uh, he sent all of this wealth and Jehoram is thinking to himself, oh my goodness, that's a lot of money, and I can't do anything about this guy's leprosy. And so some suggest maybe that's why he tore his clothes in such anger and rage. Um, actually, that's the question. Why does he tear his clothes? Well, one thought is that not only does... Uh, Jehoram know that he's unable to do anything about Naaman's leprosy. Uh, he doesn't have a relationship with a God who can actually heal this leprosy. I like what one commentator said about this. He said, this is a crisis to him because he has no relationship with the God who can heal lepers. But, and this is interesting, it is a needless crisis, and here's why because he could have a relationship with this God. Now, he knows that Elisha is the one who has the relationship with the God who can heal this man. And, but Jehoram doesn't have a good relationship with Elisha either. Remember the exchange they had between Jehoram and Jehoshaphat? And Elisha says, if it weren't for Jehoshaphat, I wouldn't even give you the time of day. That's a very loose paraphrase, but that was the, the gist of it. So it's not like Jehoram can just go to <laughs> Elisha and say, hey, Elisha, this guy sent like $1.2 million, man. Can you just like heal him and we'll split it? 
I'm, I'm reading into it. Verse 8, so it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Please, let him come to me, and he shall know, and this is interesting, that there is a prophet in Israel. Apparently, uh, the indication is he doesn't know there's a prophet in Israel that can do this and um, for him to be healed. A couple thoughts here. First of which has to do with the conspicuous absence of any mention that Jehoram had told Elisha. We're only told in the text that Elisha heard about Jehoram tearing his clothes, but we're not told how he knew about this. Uh, I think we're going to see this later on because um, I think God revealed this to Elisha. And he already knew what was happening because remember last week in chapter 4 when Elisha was sort of taken back and flabbergasted because God had not revealed something to him. The norm for Elisha was that God revealed things to him. And so it was not the norm when God didn't speak to Elisha or reveal something to him. So I'm of the belief that uh, God revealed uh, to Elisha, and I know I say Elijah on the screen. That is a misprint. I get Elijah and Elisha mixed up. But um, I believe that God um, revealed this to Elisha. And when he says that he shall know that there's a prophet in Israel, I find that interesting because uh, it seems that Elisha was probably not very welcome uh, there in the royal palace in Israel. We always kind of see him close in proximity but never right there in Israel. He's usually on the outskirts. The second thought has to do with Elisha's response, which true to form is exactly what we've come to expect from this prophet of God. Um, that of his desire to not just see God heal him, but more importantly, that Naaman would come to a saving knowledge of the God of Israel. And again, as we're about to see, not only is this man going to be healed completely of his leprosy, but he's also going to come to a saving knowledge of the true and living God, the God of Israel. Verse 9, Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And... Elisha sent a messenger to him. This is not going to go over very well. <laughs> go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. Okay. Um, something I want to point out, we talked about it last week as well, concerning what Elisha uh, does here. Actually, more importantly, what Elisha does not do here. Notice again that Elisha doesn't do this himself. Instead of going out to meet Naaman himself and tell him to wash in the Jordan seven times, he sends his servant Gehazi to do it. Okay, why? Well, it's the same reason that he had the widow go get the empty vessels herself. He didn't do it for her. He sends Gehazi to go to the mom's son who was dead to lay his staff over him and he doesn't go do it himself until the mom insists that he go. And, uh, but he's always having somebody else do it, and he stays completely out of the way. Why? This is kind of Elisha's M.O. He wants God to get all the glory. He doesn't want Naaman to think that he had anything to do with the healing that he's about to be the recipient of. So, and he wants other people to experience firsthand, and in this case, his servant Gehazi, he wants others to experience firsthand the miraculous and the grand and the glorious that God is about to do. Well, 
as we're going to see this uh, really um, enrages Naaman. Um, it says, verse 11, but Naaman became furious and went away and said, indeed, <laughs> I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Wow, this guy had it all figured out. This is, this is how God's going to heal me. I mean, you've got to give him credit. I mean, and don't be too hard on him. We do this too. Let's be honest, right? We, these are what we call directional prayers. We pray the prayer and then we give God directions on how exactly we want Him to answer the prayer we just prayed. So Lord, uh, please just pray for healing. Just pray that it happens at 2.35 p.m. in the afternoon. We pray that <laughs> you do it this way, in this color, at this time. Um, and think about this. Uh, he, the first thing he says is, surely Elisha is going to come out and meet me per personally. Doesn't he know who I am? I am the military commander of all of Syria. I am a mighty man of valor. Didn't you hear? I am an honorable man. You're a proud man. That's what you are. But that's the first thing that he becomes furious about. Verse 12. He goes on to say, Are not the Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Interesting. Again, for those of you who went to Israel with us or have been to Israel before, you, you know, the River Jordan is not that impressive. Where I come from, they call that a creek. <laughs> it's not even really a river. It's some places it's very narrow. It's very dirty. It's very small. It's, it's very unimpressive. And you sort of get the impression from Naaman that uh, you know, he wanted a mighty rushing river. Not the River Jordan. This puny little creek. This dirty little <laughs> river. That's beneath me. Again, don't you know who I am? I'm, I'm kind of playing it up a little bit because I think you're seeing just how proud this man really is. I mean, it's evidenced by... Uh, his pride being hurt. This is why he is so offended. I mean, how dare Elisha send just his servant out to meet him? Not your servant. He should come out and meet me himself. And it also, again, seems that he's incensed not only that Elisha would send his servant, but He's incensed by the fact that he would have him go into that dirty river, Jordan. Now, to me, this is textbook when it comes to pride. And I say that because, well, first of all, if I could be so candid, um, I know a lot about pride. I'm very humble about my pride. <laughs> I'm very proud of my humility. <laughs> uh, I'm keenly aware I am well acquainted with the sin of pride. And so are you. So, uh, But I know pride well, and I know my propensity to be full of pride and become proud. But this is textbook when it comes to pride. When one is full of self, they are easily offended. When one is so full of pride, they become easily offended offended their pride gets hurt proverbs 21 verse 24 says a proud and haughty man scoffer is his name he acts with arrogant pride and it's this scoffer as his name proverbs 9 verse 8 says don't correct them <laughs> don't rebuke them uh, don't offend them do not correct a scoffer lest he hates you. Then conversely, 
Rebuke a wise man and he will love you. Well, what do we know to be true about a wise man? Well, with humility comes wisdom. The more humble I am, the more wise I will be. And the flip side of that is the more proud I am, the more foolish I will be. Pride breeds foolishness. Humility breeds wisdom. Um, it's been said that people who have died to self don't flinch when someone hits them. Think about that. If I'm truly dead to the old man and I've truly died to self and I don't think more highly of myself than I ought, then I'm not easily offended. I'm not touchy. I mean, you can't insult me or insult my, my pride because I'm not full of pride. And if I've truly died to self and truly humbled myself, uh, I'm not easily offended because of that. Uh, it's been said that um, we all want to be servants until we're treated like one. Let me say that again. We all want to be servants until we're treated like one. And it's, it's the one who is treated like a servant who, when they react with such disdain, it's, an, it's evidence of the fact that they're full of pride. One of the greatest books I re refer to it often that I've ever read, uh, it's really a great devotional, it's by Roy Hessian, it's called The Calvary Road. I don't recommend it for the faint at heart. It's one of those books that you just kind of, you have to put down and go like repent <laughs> and pray and ask God <laughs> to forgive you and cleanse you. And it's like, oh, wretched man that I am. But he draws a very interesting analogy and picture of the snake versus the worm. You step on a snake and it hisses back. And you step on a worm and it just breaks. And so the, the question becomes, are you a worm or are you a snake? And the way he, he connects it to Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Lamb that was shorn. And it is, it is so convicting. And I tell you, it is a great litmus test. How do you react to people when they tell you something you don't want to hear? Do you respond by hissing like a snake? Or are you quick to break? The answer to that question will determine the degree in which you have humbled yourself or conversely the degree in which you're so full of self. If you respond like the snake, it's pride. If you respond like the worm, it's humility. And by the way, there are some uh, worms that when, when you break them, they grow back. That's interesting. That, I could take that analogy a little bit further. I won't. Verse 13, And his servants came near and spoke to him. Now keep in mind, he's just bolted in a rage. He is so offended. His pride is so wounded. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, this is interesting. Listen to this. If the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? So he went down, verse 14, and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, speaking of Elisha, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. Wow. Wow. Uh, I like these servants. Uh, they're able to reason with him. And basically what they are saying to him is, um, you, you want to do something that would be more fitting with your pride. Something grand and big, you know. And, and so if Elisha would have told you to do something that would have, you know, saved face that you could have done, that you could have 
kept your pride, you would have certainly done it. Is, is this too humbling for you to do? Naaman, don't you want to be clean? Listen, the only way you're going to be clean and, and healed is if you humble yourself and you do out of obedience what Elisha told you to do. And interesting, there's no record of any argument back and forth. They, they reasoned with him and he does it. It reminds me of what Isaiah says, Come, let us reason together, and though your sins be as scarlet, I'll make them white as snow. I'll, I'll turn that leprosy, that sin of leprosy, which leprosy is a type of sin, as we're going to see towards the end of the chapter, I will make it white as snow. Though it be as scarlet, I'll make it white as snow. Well, the, here's the point. Humbling oneself is a prerequisite to one's salvation. I know that might sound like a firm grasp of the obvious, but this is exactly what's happening here. This is the case here with this very proud man who, in order to be saved, in order to be healed, he had to humble himself. And this is why his servants said what they said. They knew that he wanted to be saved on his terms. You know people like that? They want to be saved. On, they want to come to Christ on their terms. They don't want to have to pick up their cross and die to self, humble themselves, and follow Christ. They knew that in order for him to be saved, to be healed, that he would have to humble himself, and to his credit he does. Verse 15. He returned to the man of God, he and all his aides, and came and stood before him, and he said, Indeed, now I know, and I love this, that there is no God, capital G, in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives, before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. He just turned down over $1.2 million. Okay? We could renovate our building for that right now, I'm telling you. <laughs> Please take a gift from your servant. And he says, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. So Naaman said, verse 17, then if not, and this is interesting, please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth, for your servant will no longer offer either burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. Yet, verse 18, in this thing may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the temple of Ramon to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow down in the temple of Ramon, when I bow down in the temple of Ramon, may the Lord please pardon your servant in this thing. He's asking for forgiveness for his worship of this false god. Then he said, verse 19, to him, go in peace. So he departed from him a short distance. Okay. What Naaman does here in offering this gift is actually understandable. Uh, this was a common practice, especially in that culture uh, back in that day. Uh, what's interesting to me is that when uh, Elisha uh, refuses it, that he wants to take some of the soil from the ground. Now, what's up with that? Why does he do that? Well, it seems to indicate that he's being somewhat superstitious. And that was kind of the, the thing in that day. They believed in kind of these territorial gods, the god of the hills, the god of the valley. So he was, you know, sort of thinking this ground is sacred. So he wanted that, you know, this is where God healed me. This is the area where I got saved kind of thing. So I want to take it back with me there. And I will not bow down to this god in that temple. I will only bow down to the true and living God the God of Israel. Now, at least he's sincere in his desire to worship the true God of Israel, whom he now acknowledges and accepts. 
Now it's going to get a little bit ugly, verse 20. But Gehazi, this is the faithful servant of Elisha. And the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Look, my master has spared name in this Syrian while not receiving from his hands what he brought. But as the Lord lives, I will run after him and take something from him. And I think that is intentional. When the Holy Spirit would have the narrative read like that. Notice, I will run after him and take something from him. Wow. This, this dude's loaded. We should get something out of this. This man just got healed. And he, besides, he offered it anyway. So let's chase after him so we can take some money from him. So Gehazi pursued Naaman. When Naaman saw him running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, verse 22, All is well. <laughs> My master has sent me, saying, Indeed, just now two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the mountains of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of garments. Whoa. Where I come from, they call that a lie. So Naaman, verse 23, said, Please take two talents. And he urged him, and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments and handed them to two of his servants and they carried them on ahead of him. They would have had to. Each bag would have weighed some estimate over 120 pounds. That's how heavy it would have been. He asked for one. Name is like more than happy to give them two under the banner of this is what Elisha has sent us to you to ask for. And of course he's going to do it. This man has just been given a new lease on life. New life! You can't even imagine what it would be like in that day to have leprosy. And he's just been healed. And he's just been saved for all eternity. Remember how when you first gave your life to the Lord, it, you just wanted, you would do anything for the Lord. You would give anything to the Lord. There was such a joy of your salvation. And this is what they're exploiting and taking advantage of. It's going to be very costly as we're about to see. Verse 24, when he came to the citadel, he took them from their hand and stored them away in the house. Then he let the men go, and they departed. Well, needless to say, what Gehazi does here is wrong on every level, and chiefly because he flat out lies to Naaman in order to get this money from him. And God takes this very seriously. This is a fatal mistake. The other thing that's wrong with what Gehazi does here is he uses his position as Elisha's servant to get money from a new believer, no less. This is, by any stretch of the imagination, what we would consider today to be a new believer. Someone who is, in all fairness, very vulnerable. And all he's wanting to do is to try to figure out, because he's wealthy, how much money he can get out of him. I tell you, <laughs> we need to look no further than to those uh, on television today, and even on the radio. That's why you'll never hear, you better not hear, if I ever find out that there's any kind of a tag on the end of our radio broadcast, where someone, you know, <laughs> Gehazi slips in uh, on our radio broadcast and says, hey, you need to send money to In Spirit and Truth. Um, I'm going to do what basically Elisha's about to do. <laughs> Nobody better ever do that. Because here's the problem with that. Uh, God doesn't need the money. 
And see, this is what I call poor mouthing God. And listen, I don't have very many pet peeves, but this is at the top of my pet peeve list. Poor mouthing God. Making it sound like God needs your money. The financial crisis has hit God Almighty. <laughs> Instead of owning the th cattle on a thousand hills, it's down to like 800 now. And so, you know, he's taking a hit. And, you know, God needs you like he's never needed you before. <laughs> Which in some ways is true because God has never needed me before. And so, <laughs> and he's never needed my money. But one of my pet peeves, and I, I've shared this with Eric, you know, as it relates to the building, is I don't want to ever poor mouth God. I don't want to ever come off like, hey, you need to give. God needs your money. He doesn't need your money. In fact, you know what? My Bible says that if you're not going to give cheerfully, God doesn't even want you to give. God loves a cheerful giver. And if you're giving grudgingly, keep it. Oh my goodness, keep it. God doesn't need it and God doesn't want it. God loves a cheerful giver. Someone who loves to give. That's what God wants. And, he, and it's not that God needs us to give. God knows that we need to give. Because it's a sign of transferring of the ownership of that which God has entrusted us with. What I'm saying to God is, God, this is your money. It's not that I'm giving you the minimum 10%. It's that you get, that I get to keep 90. Thank you so much, Lord. I get to keep 90. And with gratuity nowadays, 10% is a lot better deal than the restaurants. Isn't it like 15, 20% now? It's like twice as much? <laughs> I mean, the, the, the first fruits of your income belong to the Lord. And it's a surrendering of ownership to God. I'm not, I'm not wanting to do a teaching on tithing, obviously, but there's something to be learned from this. And I, I believe that this is actually the lesson of the text. And we're going to see again how seriously God takes things like this. Let me just say lastly, before I move on, I cringe. Um, when I hear pastors and ministries on the radio or the, particularly the TV, and this is why, by the way, we will never have ads on our YouTube videos. We'll never do that. That's not why we're on YouTube. We're on YouTube so that we can reach the uttermost parts of the earth with the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. That's why, by the way, we just, we give everything for free. And if you want to give, praise the Lord. We don't charge for CDs or magazines or books or anything. Just take it. Freely it was given, freely it was received, freely it's given. And <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with this, but we made the decision early on that we would not receive the offering, you know, in the formal way where they, pat again, nothing wrong with that. Uh, some Calvary chapels do it, some don't. And we just, because this is a really sensitive subject because it's been abused by so many charlatans that have made merchandise of the saints where all they've talked about is money. And they're in it for the money. And that's, the, that's the, the truth of the matter. They're in it for the money. And boy, you want to talk about turning off people. And not to mention someone like a Naaman, who is not a believer. And they, they, they come to a church, and all they hear about is money. And boy, that, that can chase them away from the Lord, and especially if God is poor-mouthed, nothing could turn them off quicker than that. But I'll tell you, these guys, I, I don't want to be anywhere near them when they're standing before the Lord and giving an account for how they beg for money and poor-mouth God. I, I don't want to be anywhere near those guys. And that's why we do 
what we do here at this church. Well, we move on, lest I get, get too far out there. Verse 25. Now, he went in, this is Gehazi, and stood before his master. And Elisha said to him, <laughs> where did you go, Gehazi? <laughs> This is what I love about Elisha. God shows him stuff, dude. You should know better. This is, this is your master. This is the prophet of God. God reveals stuff to him. And when God doesn't reveal stuff to him, it's not normal, Gehazi. It's not normal. <laughs> what are you thinking? Where did you go, Gehazi? It's kind of like when your parents know that you were in the cookie jar. And they say, hey... Were you in the cookie jar? Nope. <laughs> and that's what he's going to say. And he said, your servant didn't go anywhere. Let me just parenthetically say, before we go into verse 26, when you lie, you have to keep lying. When you lie, you have to lie because you lied. Let me say the same thing a different way. The more you lie, the more you have to lie. Because if you don't keep lying, your lie will be found out. <laughs> so, <laughs> let me tell you, when you lie, you better have a really good memory to remember what you lied about in the first place because you're going to have to keep on lying to keep that lie alive or else you're going to be found out. Verse 26, then he said to him, did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from his chariot to meet you? Come on, Gehazi. What are you thinking? Is it time to receive money and to receive clothing, olive groves and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male and female servants? That was basically what was offered to him. This isn't the time and this isn't the man and it's certainly not the time to receive from this man. God has just done a miracle here. And the glory goes to God. We're not going to exploit it, Gehazi. What are you doing? You're taking advantage of this man's generosity after being miraculously healed and eternally saved. Verse 27, Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. And he went out from his presence leprous, as white as snow. Can you even begin to get your mind around this? One, one commentator uh, mentioned this. I thought it was, was kind of insightful. He said, Gehazi wanted Naaman's wealth. And so God gave him the wealth, but he gave him what, not only name his wealth, but name his leprosy with it. Think about that. That's pretty chilling. That's pretty sobering. Well, again, I really believe that Elisha knew what Gehazi did because God revealed it to him. And... I, I can't, and, and this is hard for me to really understand. Maybe it's because greed will do that to you. Greed will blind you. Greed will, you know, mess with your mind. And all logic and understanding and reason goes out the window because you're so possessed by greed and covetousness. Covetousness can can really mess you up. And Gehazi should have known that he wasn't going to get away with this. What was he thinking? He knows who his master is, who Elisha is. And then for him to lie. I mean, he, he's lying to cover up his sin of greed and covetousness. And it must have, well, I would hope it was, unless his conscience had been seared as with a hot iron by this time. I mean, greed can do that to you. I mean, it's amazing. 
the justification, the lengths to which we'll go in order to justify the most grievous of sin. Um, to me, it, when, when Elisha says to him, is this the time? The implication being, there is a time to receive these kinds of gifts. But this isn't the time and this isn't the man. And, and here's why, Gehazi, and you should know this, we're marring the witness. We're marring the witness. In seeking after this from Naaman, we're, we're ruining our testimony. We're marring our witness. It brings reproach upon the name of the God whom we serve. G. Camel Morgan said it this way. The deepest wrong in the action of Gehazi was that it involved the divine witness. The divine witness, which had been born to the Syrian name and by the action of the little serving maid in his house. Remember her? She must have had a great witness. Gehazi, she didn't mar her witness. It was because of her witness for the Lord that he got saved by the action of the little serving maid in his house and the prophet Elisha. Their action, this is interesting, had been wholly disinterested and for the glory of God. In other words, Gehazi, this little maid, this young precious lady in her beautiful witness for the Lord as a servant in Naaman's house and the prophet Elisha like her were not interested in this man's money they were interested only in this man's soul what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and all of Naaman's money at the expense of the soul. They were not interested in that. Their only interest was in his salvation and the glory of God. How could you? And look at the price that he would pay. Not just him. All of his descendants would be cursed with leprosy, and leprosy is a curse. Leprosy, again, is a type of sin. That's how I want to close in the remaining time that we have. There's just so much typology that's woven into the fabric of this fascinating chapter. If you'll indulge me, I'll try to do it here just as quickly as I can. First of all, again, leprosy is in scripture a type of sin leprosy starts small it's not even that noticeable oh it's just a little small thing well so too is sin oh it just it just starts off as oh it's just that one little area in my life it's just it's just a little thing no big deal no big deal that's exactly how it starts and that's how leprosy starts Leprosy, interestingly, initially appears actually white, bright, shiny. <laughs> the devil appears as an angel of light. And sin, we're told in Scripture, initially can seem pleasurable. I mean, if it wasn't, where would the temptation be? I mean, Satan would have considerable difficulty if sin was not pleasurable. How, how hard would it be for Satan to tempt us to sin if sin wasn't pleasurable. It is pleasurable, but only for a season. Initially it is. Leprosy numbs the senses, so there's literally no feeling. And so too does sin numb and sear our conscience, and it leaves no conviction. 
The, f the first time we do something, there's conviction. And then interesting, this is how it is with sin. We become more and more callous, and it becomes easier the next time, and then easier still the next time, and then pretty soon it becomes habitual, and the conviction is no longer felt as it once was. We don't have those same sensitive feelings that completely numbs our senses. Leprosy progressively and even aggressively can spread over the entire body. And this is the nature of sin, is it not? That it can spread throughout the entire body, not just of a believer, but the entire body of Christ. Leprosy, and this is what makes it so hideous. I mean, if you saw pictures, and maybe you have, of what leprosy does to a body, I mean, it literally rots the parts of the body. Digits are completely gone. And there's no feeling. There's no feeling. I mean, literally, the nose is, is, has just rotted away from the leprosy, just eats it away. And is that not what sin does? Sin can cause those in the body to fall away. Leprosy is shameful. It creates and causes shame. And is that not what sin does? Sin creates and causes shame. It need not. The shame need only last as long as it takes us to get to the cross and ask for forgiveness. Leprosy isolates. Leprosy separates one from others. So too does sin isolate and separate us from others. And I'll, I'll add, this is exactly Satan's strategy, is to get us isolated and separated from the body of Christ. Leprosy is incurable. Uh, and the end of it is always death. Leprosy will always bring about death in the end, just like sin. Sin is not curable. Sin is not curable. It's incurable. And the wages of sin is that it brings forth death. Leprosy cannot be cured, but it can be cleansed. Now, interesting, because sin cannot be cured, but sin can be forgiven and cleansed. First John 1 John 1.9, it's been called the Christian bar of soap. If we will confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all our unrighteous leprosy, if you will. Well, I really like this, this servant girl. Uh, she played a huge part in this. I mean, truly, if it were not for her sharing the good news that there was healing and cleansing <laughs> available to this man, he would have never been healed and never been cleansed. If you think about it, she shared the good news with him. Just like we as his servants share the good news of salvation and healing and cleansing in the person of Jesus Christ. God's prophet called Naaman to him to be cleansed, just like God calls us to him to be cleansed. And Naaman too sought out Elisha to be cleansed, just like we seek the Lord as well to be cleansed. He sends a messenger to speak to Naaman, in this case Gehazi, just like God sends his messengers to speak to us. Naaman, though, saw this as humbling, even humiliating, and foolish. I mean, dip in the Jordan River seven times. How stupid is that? How idiotic is that? Well, is that not how the cross is seen to those who are perishing? It's seen as humiliating, and it's seen as foolish, just like Naaman saw this way to be cleansed as. Naaman 
had to obey God and he had to humble himself in order to be cleansed, so too must we obey God. And we absolutely must humble ourselves to be saved. I think it's an interesting little detail. Again, I think it's the typology in it. His, and it's not there just to fill up space in the verse. We're told that his hideous leprous skin became as the skin of a baby. You know how soft a baby's skin is? You know, as you get older, your skin's all rough and, yeah, can't wait for my new body and my new, oh Lord, this skin's getting a lot of miles, on, especially the skin on my face, but it was as a baby's skin, as a little child. Is that not how we come to Christ? As a little child, <laughs> we have to humble ourselves with that childlike faith. Naaman went into the Jordan River, and I see this as a, a type or a picture of water baptism. Some of us have been baptized in the Jordan River as well. That's what we do when we're saved. And it is a command. Water, it's not necessary for salvation, but it is a command as a result of and a public profession of salvation, that identification with Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection when you come out of the water. Naaman was saved. Think about this. He didn't merit it. He couldn't buy it, even if he wanted to. He had the money, but he didn't have enough. <laughs> There was nothing he could do to merit this. There was no works that he could do. Oh yes, he was an honorable man, doubtless a good man, a mighty man of valor, a wealthy man, but there was nothing that he could do. He was saved by grace through faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Not of works, lest any man should boast. It's the gift of God that we're saved saved by grace through faith. And that's how it is for us as well. This is interesting. I need you to think this through with me. We've talked about this before in other uh, types in the Old Testament. But um, seven we know is the number of completion. Well, we know that the cross, the finished work of the cross was the ultimate completion. The, the, the work of the cross was completed. It is finished completed. There's nothing more that can be added. It's not, it is finished but, or it is finished however, or it is finished if. No, it is finished period. Now, he's told to dip seven times in the river Jordan. Think about this. Jesus bled in seven places. The number of completion. Both of his wrists, that's two. Both of his feet, that's four. The crown of thorns is five. The back when he was whipped is six. And the side when he was pierced is seven. Seven places he bled on that cross. The number of completion just as Naaman dipped seven times. Not six, not eight, seven times. The number of completion. And he was completely healed. And how much faith would that have had to take? I think about the Israelites marching around Jericho seven times. And on the seventh, the seventh one, the fifth day, are you sure? Seven, right? Seven's the number? Okay, seven. Okay, two more days, two more times. Here's Naaman dipping in the river Jordan. Okay, that was five, right? You guys counting, that was five. Okay, now here, here's six. And he's still not, and it was until that seventh time that he came out and he was completely healed. Not the sixth time, the seventh time it was completed. And lastly, Naaman, Naaman forsook the worship of false gods. And is that not how it is when we come to Christ? There's a repentance, there's a change. We forsake this world, the things of this world, the worship of the false gods in this world. And we worship the only true and living God. Yes, we're still in the world, but we're no longer of the world. 
No longer do we worship or are we enslaved to the God of this world. Why don't you all stand? We'll pray. Lord, again, thank you for your word and thank you for this chapter and just all that is here in this chapter. So much that we can take home with us tonight and begin by the Holy Spirit to apply to our lives. And, and um, Lord, we, we thank you so much for the joy of our salvation. For those of us who have been walking with you for many, many years, it's, it's so refreshing sometimes to just study chapters like this in our Bibles because we just see how it is. It's kind of a remembrance of how it is that we all came to you and were born again of the Spirit of God when we were saved. Oh, Lord, restore unto us like David prayed Restore unto us the joy of our salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.